resistors, but it had two LEDs back to back, which acted like, res like resistors. And we experimented with different fan designs. We um, designed 16 fan blades, and we used the one that was the most efficient for its size. Evaluation. Overall, our group performed very, very well. When we encountered an obstacle, we managed to persevere and uh, generate many different ideas to get around that obstacle that we found uh, fit best. Uh, when we were working together, we got along very well and were able to accomplish tasks and work as one unit. With that being said, we didn't communicate very well. Oftentimes, we didn't have enough people on one project, on one part of the project, and then too many on the other, uh, which really just leads to we needed a clear division of labor. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons throughout the project. Uh, one of the lessons that we learned is that attention to detail is key because there's so many parts of the project that need um, to be reviewed before um, the project can start um, being created. And that's, that goes in with our second lesson that every project needs a plan before building can start. And we learned that the hard way because we tried to make our initial design, but it was obviously too big and it didn't uh, have enough room. I had plenty of room, but I didn't have enough thought into it before um, we moved on to the second project. And uh, we also learned that mistakes are inevitable and we made a lot of mistakes throughout the project. Uh, for the overall cost of the project, the miscellaneous you see listed here in slides 10 and 11 were things that we had on hand at the school that we didn't need to go out and purchase, but still costed more than $15, so we felt that they were necessary to be listed. Our initial budget for the project was $200, and we ended up coming out mighty under budget at $122.11. Uh, initially, we purchased a pre-made LED, uh, the regulator, the fan, and the lithium batteries. Then after figuring out that we liked the LED, but we, we struggled with really fitting it on, making it seamless on our, LED, on our uh, housing, we purchased some tiny LEDs and the circuit boards, and we created the LEDs and made it fit seamlessly on the housing, creating the final product that you see ahead of you. All right, so our final was versus our initial goals. Um, some of our initial goals were to have a, a working light which can mount onto a bike. Um, we wanted to have a light which can be fully powered by wind that's generated while biking. Uh, we wanted to create an efficient fan and test plenty of different prototypes to find the optimum design. And we did, we did um, all of those goals. And we ended up with a light that can be mounted onto a bike Yep, as you can see in the picture, uh, we have a light which is fully powered by wind, and we have created 16 different fans for the most efficient design, as you maybe can see on the table here. And here are a couple of the major sources we used during our research. And I also wanted to personally thank each and every one of you for coming and sitting through this presentation and learning about the bike light we spent the last semester working on. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So we do have a question uh, from Mr. Warnock. He wants to know if your wind turbine um, is, is your wind turbine more efficient than a wheel hub generator, meaning like the traditional ones that would connect to a wheel hub for generating a uh, light. Um, I am not totally sure. We didn't really research that type of um, generation, uh, electricity gen generation, so I couldn't tell you if they compared in any way. <coughs> Um, any other questions from the audience? All right. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Right. Grab your seat. Thank you. So um, our next team, uh, it worked with plants and salt. And I'll just leave it at that much. You guys just started to look at So we'll go ahead and get rolling. So, good afternoon. Today we are going to be talking about our STEM project, which was conferring salt resistance in plants by a rising spheric bacteria. Some of the hosts of issues that have arisen due to climate change are increased soil salinity as well as more frequent freshwater droughts. The goal of our project was to address both of these threats to crop stability and glo <clears throat> global food security by finding a way to grow plants in a saline environment. I'm Audrey Carter. I was the project manager for this group, so I wrote the initial proposal for this project. My job was kind of to make sure that everyone was on track and knew what was going on, as well as guide the general direction of experiments and research. 
So I'm Charlotte Mills. I was lead of communications. So I set up and facilitated meetings with our mentors, as well as was the main communicator between the group and the teacher. I'm Erin Pagliocci. I was the budgeter. I kept track of the group finances and supervised all the purchases of items for a project. I'm Allison Smith. I was the gardener of the group. So that means I helped grow the plants and I would collect data on them. Um, and I'm Ella Sweet and I was the photographer, so I just um, took pictures of the plants, plant growth every day, and then I also documented the major things that the group was working on. Our mentors for this project were Mr. Connor King, a PD, PhD student in cell and molecular biology at CSU, as well as Dr. Brad Borley, associate professor of bacteriology at CSU. We met with them several times over the course of the project, as well as communicated pretty constantly over email. They were vital in figuring out what was possible given the scope of the class and provided constant support uh, at every phase of the project. So initially our group was planning on crossbreeding a hollow a halophytic tomato, which means a salt resistant, with a glycophytic tomato, which means a salt sensitive, in order to produce an offspring that is a glycophytic tomato plant, but can be watered with salt water. However, with our time constraints, we realized that this would not be possible. Sorry. And <laughs> so with uh, the help from our mentors, Mr. King and Dr. Borley, we found a research paper in which the researchers answered the exact same question that we had. However, instead of crossbreeding the tomatoes, they isolated the halophilic bacteria and put it into a glycophilic plant. That made it so the glycophilic plant's roots were inoculated to salt water, and we decided that that would probably the direct, be the direction we would go for our project too. However, in the research paper, they used alfalfa seeds, and we decided to go with the Wisconsin fast plant brassica rapa seeds because its total lifespan is only 14 days. So as far as the timeline for this project, we mainly split up our work by month. So in September, we spent our times kind of getting our bearings and doing a lot of research, as well as reading scientific papers that were provided to us by our mentors. Uh, we also gathered dirt samples from places around the city with potentially high salinity levels, and we got other materials that we would need along the way. In October, we isolated the bacteria from the roots of samples from the salty dirt that we collected, and we planted the seeds and inoculated them with our bacteria. And in November, we monitored the growth of the plants and analyzed any possible changes of the salinity. Let me try. I might have clicked off, sorry. Um, so for our design, we needed something that would answer the question of, will plants inoculated with halophilic bacteria grow in a saline environment? So the way we did this was by having five groups of plants, each consisting of two individual plants. So our first group was a freshwater control with no bacteria, and it was being watered with fresh water. Um, we also had a saltwater control that also didn't have bacteria, and it was being watered with salt water. And then we had three experimental plants with a different concentration of salinity in the bacteria that we inoculated them with. So we had a 0.5% concentration, a 1% concentration, and a 2% concentration. And we monitored the growth and possible effects of the saltiness, as well as the dirt salinity each week. Okay, so we went through three design plans. Our initial design diagram was we went over a lot of options, including cross-breeding, genetic editing, as well as comparative analysis. So like Aaron said, we were going to use tomatoes, but because of the constraints and after talking with our mentors, we saw that this was not an option for us. So we moved on to our intermediate design, where we were going to use the brassica rapa, which is a mustard plant, and we were going to inoculate them with the bacteria and fertilizer. We had split them up into five different groups that Audrey has already outlined. We were going to hang a grow light from the cabinets because they needed light at all times. So these plants were only supposed to survive two weeks. They survived three weeks and still hadn't died yet. So we moved on to our final design diagram, which was putting them up on risers. Because they had survived so long, we problem solved and figured out that they just weren't getting enough light. 
So as a class, we did not have that big of a budget. So we decided as a group that our best course would be to ask companies like Lowe's and Home Depot for donations. Um, luckily, the school already had a lot of materials that we needed and we got mainly everything donated. However, we did have to spend $32 on the Wisconsin Fast Plants Brass Carabba Seeds. There were four major phases of the project. The first was researching and collecting soil samples. So we researched three different places that had high salinity in their soil. So we went to LeMay and Troby, the South Platte River in Greeley, as well as places along the school. So we would test for the salinity by using a conductivity probe. After seeing which one had the high salinity, we would collect the roots from plants that grew in that area, moving on to our second major phase of the project, which was collecting that bacteria and culturing it. To collect the bacteria, we had to grind up the roots that we had collected, and we had to culture them in the machine that you can see there. We cultured them for about a week, and then we moved on to our third phase, which was germinating and growing the plants. To germinate the plants, we put them in a petri dish with distilled water for about two days. Then we moved them to pots with soil, and we put about three or four seeds in the pots, and we added our bacteria that we had just cultured with the fertilizer that we had made, and we grew these plants for about three weeks, and we watered them according to what they were. So fresh water got fresh water, salt water got salt water, as well as the other three groups. During this time, we would analyze the collected data. So the results of our project was that 1% performed the best. We found this out by comparing it to the freshwater growth. So we saw that the 1% had stayed alive the longest and grown the tallest. We, we have a hypothesis of why this occurred. We suspect that there was a Goldilocks in the concentration of salinity that we had. We suspect that the 0.5% didn't weed out enough of bacteria, while the 2% perhaps weeded out too much and didn't allow for enough bacteria to help the plant grow. While we do have this hypothesis, we do believe more trials will be necessary to come to a complete conclusion. This is really important because we're able to see, we have to start moving off of fresh water, especially with climate change. So if we are able to do this with other plants, other crops, this, I think this could really improve our world. One of the things that we all think we did really well with as a group was our communication. Um, we were constantly having to communicate as a group to just let it, each other know we were doing that day and then the next couple of days. And also allocating the workload to so just distributing it fairly among all the group members. Um, our organizational skills were also used a lot, not only with the physical aspects of the project, but also with all of the data and documentation as well. Um, flexibility was another must have because we really had to adapt our plan a lot over the scope of this project um, and we had to persevere through a lot of challenges and one example of that is when our hypothesis didn't match up with the data that we were receiving and then some of the things we learned on and or like learned from and would have improved if we had done this project again would be so we didn't really have a direction in the beginning and that could have been solved by finding a mentor earlier on and also our planning and time management could have been really improved and that would have maximized our efficiency. And we should have found ways to extend our project by going deeper into our research during the free time we had in the main experiment. So really quickly, I wanted to thank um, some people who helped with our project. So of course, uh, Mr. Connor King and Dr. Brad Borley, our mentors, as well as Miss Meredith Cleland um, at Cargill, who helped us during our initial brainstorming phase, and Dr. Jessica Metcalf at CSU, who helped us explore potential bacteria sequencing options. And we also wanted to thank the Loveland Home Depot, Fort Collins Home Depot, and the Council Tree Lowe's for donations of materials. Thank you. Any questions? Um. <clears throat> Vicki uh, Jordan is asking, um, can you explain how soils in Colorado become salinated when we're nowhere near an ocean? Yeah, so it has to do with the water cycle. And uh, I think I am, I, I'm not 100% clear on this. So if I mess some things up, I apologize. I, as far as I know, it has to do with the water cycle and um increased salinity levels in rain uh that can lead to overall increased salinity levels like in 
landlocked areas. It's even more of an issue that we see in uh, in states and areas that are bordering the ocean. Um, so you'll see sort of groundwater uh, infiltration of salt into groundwater um, that will kind of corrupt the soil. And also, I think there's some airborne pollutants that ca can um, increase soil salinity, I believe. Thanks, guys. Uh, <laughs>
and get all and let the drone know like what where all the motors are and what kind of frame it is. Um, yeah, so we had a few major pro uh, a few major phases throughout the project. Our first phase was research and development, and this is where we looked in and researched our different parts and checked their compatibility, and also making sure that we were getting the best um, for our price. And then after that, we move on to our construction phase, and this is where we actually built the physical drone, like how it looks now. Um, just like plugging everything in and getting everything mounted to the frame. And then after that, we moved on to tuning and calibration. And this is like the non-physical side of everything. So like pairing um, our receivers and our like physical uh, controller and just making sure everything uh, worked on the software side. And then if all that was like good, like our parameters were set right, um, we'd move on to bench testing. And this is where you like strap the drone down to a table so it has like around an inch of slack. Um, and turn everything on and make sure that it can fly that like inch above the table without like flipping out. Um, and that would just be making sure that your parameters are set right. And then after that, you'd move on to the actual flying. And yeah, this is our final product. So the drone is fully built and the hardware is ready to fly. Um, it just needs a couple parameters, which we tried meeting with our um, mentor last week, but unfortunately we couldn't quite get the parameters right to get it up in the air. And then our receiver is paired, which is kind of the thing we had the most trouble with in this project, was trying to get that thing to pair. Um, and then the camera feed functions just fine. And then the drone is in a place where with some extra time, I think we could get it up in the air. So the overall cost of our project was $890. Uh, the majority of that price, or a third of that price, was actually buying the flight controller, which was, like we've said earlier, the like main thing on the drone that controls everything, like everything talks through that to make the drone function. We were able to have uh, $200 of that covered early on in the project by a donation from Rick Ferrari, and uh, he works for Intel, and Intel matched that $100, so we got $200 to start. And then we were having trouble finding some uh, additional funding, so we applied for the OtterBox grant, and they, they accepted our application and paid for the rest of our project. All right, so some lessons we learned throughout the project. Uh, first was that we need we need to come into a project with a base level of knowledge. So we spent at least three weeks at the beginning of our project going through and researching to make sure all of the parts we mentioned are compatible with each other and that they would work together. Um, we need to ask more questions. We spent a lot of time asking, emailing back and forth with our mentor, Christopher Robertson uh, at CSU. We, we spent a lot of time emailing back and forth with him, asking questions, and we had a lot of meetings with him. Uh, and during those meetings, we need to take better notes. So during our first couple of meetings, we took a lot of mental notes and we learned quickly that you forget mental notes kind of fast. So on our third meeting, we had Sean uh, go through and take some notes, some bulleted notes so that we can remember everything in our meeting. And we need to read instructions carefully uh, because sometimes if we didn't read our instructions carefully, it took us two or three attempts to build uh, a specific part onto the drone when we could have done it in one attempt. Uh, yeah, so this is our group performance reflection. Overall, as a team, we worked well together, um, but we did have a few roadblocks along the way. Um, that includes like waiting for parts, especially in the beginning of the project, and then we also had issues with pairing, and then a few times we also followed the steps in the wrong order. And so to overcome these things, we really just had to like work as a team and like kind of just like take a step back and just have a conversation about how we should move forward. Um, but kind of going along with that waiting for parts, there was a few other times where we could have been more efficient with our time when we have like um, a period of downtime like that. Uh, we kind of just like take our, uh, like halt our um, project. And so we could have been a little bit better with that. We want to give a huge thanks to Otterbox <clears throat> as they um, funded the majority of our project through the use of their uh, grant. We wanted to thank Rick Ferrari and Intel. Uh, I was able to get in contact with Rick Ferrari through uh, my dad. He knows him from treating him as a patient, and I was able to get a hold of him, and he said he could donate his personal $100, like I said earlier, and Intel was willing to match that, so it was very helpful to get that baseline, uh, like that initial donation to our project. Uh, and we want to give a special thank you to Christopher Robertson and our and the CSU Drone Center. Christopher Robertson here, he was our mentor throughout the project. He helped us learn what some of the parts did and how they connected with each other. 
Um, and then he allowed us to come into his drone center a couple of times during the project. So the first time we went in, uh, he, he and his lab assistant, Ryan, helped us to so help show us how to solder on all of the wires and stuff onto the drone. And the second time he helped us try to go through the parameters list. Um, and here's just some of our sources. That first source was our major source. That's the Ardu Pilot website, and it just kind of gives an overview of everything that you would put on a drone. Next up is our hydroponic garden team, and we'll go ahead and get rolling. Okay, so our project was a hydroponic garden. I'm Brenda Schneider. I was the project manager. I was the one who made the initial proposal last year for the project. I'm Brian Bauerfeind, and I was a builder on the project. I'm Hannah Rose, and I was a photographer. I'm Leah, and I was also a builder on the project. So first of all, I'm going to give a big thank you to all our mentors who helped us out, including Kyle Taylor, the shop teacher, who helped us construct the garden, Leslie Smyzer, the botany teacher, who was with the greenhouse space, and also Bill Bowerly, a CSU professor, who overviewed our final design. So the purpose of our project, for those of you who don't know, hydroponic gardens are essentially gardens that use no soil. The roots of the plants are instead submerged with water and liquid nutrients. And hydroponic gardens can be converted vertically and can be grown indoors and outdoors, which makes them much more efficient than normal gardens. And only 3% of the world's soil is fertile and it's declining at about 24 billion tons per year. And hydroponics is the solution, being that it doesn't use any soil. Um, yeah. So the initial and primary goals on our project would be to grow plants in a sustainable way using no soil grow a yield of vegetables with our garden before the end of the year, donate the grown vegetables to the food bank, and compare our yield to soil-grown plants, which the soil-grown plants would be our pretty much baseline comparison plants. So this is our timeline and schedule. It's a Gantt chart, and we had three major phases in our project. There was the building phase, the assembly phase, and the monitoring phase. And we got through the phases pretty on time, but there were a few setbacks with ordering and yeah. So we had to do initial research on three main things. The first one being the pump, because we needed a pump that could pump through a hose up an angle for about five feet. And we found that we had to have a pump that pumps at 300 gallons per hour because we didn't want the water to flow too fast so, the, so that the plants can't pick up the nutrients. And we didn't want it to flow too slow so that it promotes flooding within the PVC pipes. And the second thing we had to do research on was plant types because not all plants promote a hydroponic lifestyle because um, some plants breathe through their roots and others don't. And we eventually landed on lettuce, kale, Swiss chard, and peppers. And the third thing we had to do research on was nutrients because plants need 16 essential nutrients, the main three being nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, and we eventually landed on nutrients that had two parts, base A and base B, where the ratios between the two parts depend on the phase of growth they're in. So for the initial design of our garden, we had two sideboards that would be filled with two by fours in a pretty much window pattern. And inside of the two by fours, there would be some PVC pipes that would be alternating down at a slope. And at the end of each PVC pipe, there would be two 90 degree elbows that allowed the water to flow into them and then flow right back down into the next PVC pipe. And on the top of each PVC pipe, we would have seven holes that would hold cups. And on the bottom of the cups, there would be little X's that would hold the roots in. And at the bottom of our garden, there would be a bucket. And in the bucket, we'd have a pump, a 300 gallon per hour pump that would flow the water right back up to the top via hose. And we changed the 90 degree elbow concept by drilling holes in the bottom of the PVC pipes and installing this top hat design that would allow the water to flow down through the top hat through a pipe that would just flow right back into the next PVC pipe. And we experimented using some Ninja Flex 3D print material, but with the time we had for the project, we decided to just buy some pipe. Okay, so for construction, um, the building of this project kind of took place naturally in two phases. First we built the wood frames and then we built the PVC pipes that went in between. So for phase one, we used two by fours and OSB wood as well as table saw and table saw and a lot of measuring. And we built those two structures at the sides of our project. And after everything was constructed, we sanded everything smooth, painted it with color and then with a protective top coat. 
And then for the second phase, which was the PVC pipes, we used a hole saw, like in that first picture. We drilled six to seven holes in four PVC pipes of equal spacing. And then we glued end caps on the ends of our PVC pipes. So for assembly, after we finished constructing everything, we brought all of our stuff into the greenhouse of our school and we assembled it exactly how it looks in that picture. And so the PVC pipes are attached to the wood frames using fisheye hooks and paracord. So they're essentially just like tied to the wood boards. And at all of the joints, like where the PVC pipes meet, they don't really touch. Instead, there's a plastic tube that goes from one to the next that Brian explained in the last slide. And so that's how the water goes down. So next is the monitoring and grow phase. In this phase, we went to the back garden house and we bought some starter vegetables, which we inserted into the hydroponic system. We put 22 of these plants in the actual hydroponic garden and we potted nine of them in soil as our control group. What went really well during this phase is obviously our water levels and our nutrients amounts were correct. So the plants lived and they grew in the system with the exception of our peppers. We learned from our mentors later on that certain plants rely on oxygen from the roots more than others. This wouldn't be a problem in a soil environment, but because the plants roots were completely submerged in the water, they couldn't get any oxygen. So that's why our peppers failed in the hydroponic garden. Another problem we had was a little aphid infestation. Fortunately, we caught it pretty early on, so we were able to use neem oil and eradicate the aphids before they harmed our produce. Um, harvesting phase, what went really well during this phase is for a short two week almost period, we had plants in the system. We got a pretty substantial harvest. We did over harvest a little bit, but ultimately it was the end of the project. So this is just something to note for Future, further use of the garden. Results. So one of our main goals for the project was to compare our hydroponic garden plants to the control plants in the soil. Um, through observation and harvesting, we saw that our plants in the system grew faster and produced more than our control plants. So our initial budget, we came out as $590 and we planned on raising half of that with a GoFundMe. And within the first three days, we raised $255 in our GoFundMe. And by the end of our project, we spent about $490. So that $255 from our GoFundMe amounted to about 52% of the entire project. And we wanted to say thank you to all our donors. So from GoFundMe, we had Tara and John Schneider, Aja Blokovich, Susan Tejan, Don Prickett, Amy Hartman Lother, April Newman, Shalana Ruffner, and Allie Peterson. And we wanted to say thank you to Lowe's for starting our project off and giving us all of our initial supplies. And thank you to Mr. Dana Howard for donating some of his supplies to us also, overall helping us come under budget. So our group, we really worked well together. We didn't really have any drama. And in the end, we accomplished our main goal, which is to create a fully functioning hydroponic garden. So I think overall, I can speak for all of us when I say we learned a lot of new skills, whether that be in the wood shop or working as a team. And I think the biggest lesson we learned was to learn how to use a tool before you actually use it. <laughs> and, uh, I also learned that not everything goes to plan and that timelines are suggestions and that it's okay to fall behind. You just need to make sure to make it up in other departments. And then I think we learned about a lot about plants as a whole, like what Hannah Rose was saying about how some plants breathe through their roots. And we also learned about like working on team, working on a team has its benefits and also has its faults. So working as a team, essentially you would think like, we can get stuff done so much faster because there's multiple people working on it, but also it provides many distractions. So it really just depends on how you handle it. And these are all of our sources. Are there any questions? Yes, there are. Uh, from the audience, uh, how are you going to manage water if we have a scarcity problem? So do you see the intent of the question? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, overall, the plants, they don't use that much water. You have to recycle water. It can recycle for up to like two, three weeks, and then you replace the water as a whole after a month. So it doesn't actually use as much water as potted plants do, which is actually pretty crazy. Um, yeah. Okay. And then um, Vicki Jordan asked, uh, how, how did you manage algae, algae growth? Sure. 
Yeah, so that wasn't something we had to plan for initially. So that was one of the things you might have seen, you might not have noticed, was that we used a bucket that was solid colored instead of clear because light mixed with water obviously produces algae. And so um, having that darker color, colored bucket and like the PVC being solid colored helped prevent algae. And then also replacing and cleaning out the system once a month also prevents that. Any right. other questions? Thanks, guys. Yeah. Our group of young teachers. Um, okay, so our project is bringing STEM into elementary schools. I'm Ryan. I was a lesson designer and the project manager. I'm Zaylin. I'm the classroom coordinator, keeping communication with teachers. I'm Aubrey, I was a lab designer and a photographer. I'm Madeline, I was also a lab designer and I helped with the finances. As we were researching for our project, we found out that since 1990, there has been a 79% increase in, of employment in STEM occupations, as well as STEM... I messed you up, sorry. Oh, good. STEM occupations also have double the average wage rather than a non-STEM occupation. Therefore, it's very important that students currently are getting exposed to STEM in school. And if they're getting exposed to STEM in elementary schools, it will increase their interest in pursuing a STEM career, which is why we chose to go into fourth grade classrooms in our community and teach them about STEM. Yeah, so as Madeline said, it's super, super important to start teaching these kids STEM lessons at a young age so then they can pursue them in the future. Um, we knew we were already taking up a lot of the time in the classroom that these students had, so we started planning for our labs by looking at the fourth grade PhD science curriculum. So our chemical and physical changes lab, as well as our electricity lab, fit in with their physical science portion of what they're learning this year. And then our erosion lab fit in with their earth and space system science of what they're learning. We also wanted to bring some new information in, so we also created a lab about 3D printing so they could get some new knowledge. Um, and then as far as presenting the information and what sort of labs we wanted to do, as you can see here in this Purdue Research Program diagram, um, hands-on learning was the way we decided to go because it's the best method for teaching them the STEM topics and getting them to really understand it and absorb the information to use in the future. We had three main goals for our project. Our first one was to create a four-week lesson plan. Our second was to give a baseline understanding of STEM knowledge. And our third one was to collect feedback from students and teachers to see how we could improve our labs. So right after we created the groups at the beginning of August, we started by setting basic goals and a simple timeline for how long we wanted each part of the lab to take. Um, and then during September, we started coordinating with teachers and mentors to create labs and lesson plans to go along with those. Then we used those labs in October, brought them into two different schools. We went to Bacon and Cruz, um, and we did that for four weeks, giving a different lesson each week. And then during November, we collected feedback from teachers and students um, on those labs. I think had a couple big stages that we focused on. One was keeping contact and getting into the classroom. So we reached out to six different schools, trying to plan dates and times that would work best for them. Also asking them what their curriculum was so we can incorporate that. Then we went into planning our different labs, so kind of like what it was going to look like, what materials we needed, how long the lab was going to take, and things like that. And then another one was our budget, kind of giving us an idea of how much supplies we would need, how much it would cost, and how much we would need to fundraise for the future. Also, so some struggles that we faced along the way was time management. We only had about 45 minutes in a classroom to teach a lesson and give a hands-on lab. So it was a little bit of a time crunch to try to teach all of that. Also limited days of prep. We were in a classroom Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Monday and Tuesday we went to Bacon, and then Wednesday we went to Cruise, which meant, and Cruise was a week ahead, so we had two different labs going on. So we had to prep for two new labs and to clean up for the, prep the week before. Communication, we emailed um, multiple times and not hearing uh, hearing back from them. So then after a couple of months, we decided to call them and contact the schools to see if we could set up a date and time to talk to them and their whole team to see what would work best, uh, which actually worked great because we could talk over any questions um, if there was times or concerns that I had. And then times and dates, it was hard to get 45 minutes each week out of a classroom. So it was really flexible from the teachers. 
All right, so our first lab was erosion, and we knew that many of the students didn't have any background knowledge in erosion. So we started with a presentation and we gave them a definition of erosion with visuals as well as examples that they could see like around here. And then they each got a sand block with green sand on the top to kind of represent soil or just like the earth. And then we did four different types of erosion. And for the first one, we did wind. So they got a straw and they got to blow on their sand and they got to watch the green sand kind of fall off their sand block. And then for heavy rain, they got to represent rain by using a spray bottle and spraying it on top of their sand block. And for grazing, they got small plastic animals and they kind of stamped it on their sand to represent the animal eating the grass. And then running water, they got a cup of water and they got to make their own canyon with their sand block. And then once they finished their sand block, they had a worksheet and they kind of got to draw what they saw happening when they were doing the hands-on experiment and then they had to write two things that they learned or observed. Next was our 3D printing lab. We first started with a presentation on how 3D printing kind of worked and the technology that we use, which is Tinkercad. So we kind of signed them up for all of that. And then we also brought a 3D printer into the classroom so they could see how a printer works and like see it in motion. Then they all got to make their own lab or their own print. And there were some prints that turned out great, like these that we were able to print if we wanted. But then there's also prints that were kind of had a lot of things thrown in with overhangs and things floating in the air that we showed them that we couldn't print them. Third lab that we gave to the students was on electricity. We started by giving them just a simple definition of electricity and some examples of how they may see it in their lives. And then we gave them a basic understanding of simple circuits and switches. Um, as well as open and closed circuits. And then we started by giving them just an LED and a battery and having them play around with the positive and negative light to see if they could get it to light up on their own. And then we gave them a cross stick, some conductive tape, and then two different types of switches, which was tearing paper. Okay, so our co project cost us seven hundred three hundred dollars and as you can see, the electricity lab cost the most just because we had to purchase a small coin battery for each of the students so they were able to keep their light bulb and we had to test a, a couple different labs for the electricity lab, but all the materials that weren't used in our project that were left over were given back to the STEM class, which can be used for future years. At the end of the four weeks, we guys, can... I'm sorry, I'm going to pause you for a second. I think, do we have audio back on audience? <clears throat> Actually, that's my mic. Sorry. to complete a different activity. The students loved it and they would change it by just wanting us to come back for more weeks. So if we did have more time to continue it, we would make sure we give ourselves more time to prep and to give the lessons and things like that. We want to thank our mentors, Andrew Warnock and Vicki Jordan. They helped us uh, figure out how the labs work and present them to students so that they get the full knowledge. Um, and we also want to thank Otterbox because that is how we funded our project fully with the grant. Um, overall, we worked well as a team, especially in professional settings. We could have improved our team communication and our time management working together, but we reached all of our goals and finished our project su successfully. And then these are just our citations. 
All right. Uh, Vicki wants to know what lesson was the most well received by the students and teachers? Just so you guys know, we lost Mike for a bit in there, so you might have said some of that and we didn't catch it. So. So the teachers thought that the students learned the most in the erosion, and that's probably just because there was a lot of content in that. But the students, their favorite one was either the chemical and physical changes or the 3D printing, more because it was hands on and something new. They also like things that explode. So I think that's also why they like the chemical and physical changes. Hello, I'm Kira Lysico. I'm the project manager and communications officer on this project. Our project, we called it the Panel Genetic Modification Project. Uh, these are my teammates. I'm Miati Kajmola. I researched the details into the procedures we did. I'm Claire Vincent. I was in charge of the plants as well as being the photographer for our group. Um, I'm Alex Cargo. I was in charge of the budget and I also uh, did a lot of research. So our initial um, inspiration for this problem was to come up with a solution for the declining bee populations due to loss of floral habitat. So how we decided to go about this was creating a flower that was very attractive to bees, but also provided them with the pollen and nectar they would need. So that leads us to our primary goal of inserting a gene that would promote blue coloration in a plant due to the fact that bees are very attracted to the color blue. Our secondary goal was simply to become more familiar with advanced genetic concepts that we wouldn't become familiar with in high school. We also had a series of secondary goals, such as gaining more familiarity with lab work and growing plants. Our timeline for this project had six phases. We started with research, then we began growing our plants. Later, we synthesized our plasmid, integrated that plasmid into agrobacterium, which we then infected our plants with. Lastly, we observed results. This series of steps seemed the simplest and most effective way to accomplish our goals in a timely manner. Initially, we planned two months of research, one month of planting, and one month of procedure. However, this was subject to lots of change due to shipping delays and further research. Initial research. So for our plants, we chose to grow Arabidopsis thaliana, mainly because they grew within our timeline. They have a full life cycle about six weeks, they produce lots of seeds and they're a lot of, used a lot in other lab work, so we had a lot of resources. There was a lot of research that went into the genetic portion of this project, but we found that delphinidin is a protein in plants that promotes blue coloration. And we found that our gene in shorthand, um, F3 prime, 5 prime H, creates the enzyme that creates delphinidin in plants. So to get this into our plants, we needed it to be in a form of DNA called a plasmid, which is essentially a circle of DNA. This plasmid also had to have antibiotic resistance and herbicide resistance for varieties of control reasons in this project, which um, this you can see here is an actual diagram of our plasmid. We also had a control plasmid of which we observed the effects in our plants. So in order to actually genetically change the color of a flower, we looked into various methods. We looked into CRISPR, which is genome editing, floral dip, which is seed infection, and two methods of infiltration. One was vacuum infiltration, which deals with pressure manipulation, and one was syringe infiltration. We decided to do floral dip and vacuum infiltration because they were the simplest and most cost effective. So in order to actually uh, do these means of genetic modification, we had to integrate the previously mentioned plasmid into the agrobacterium and E. coli. Uh, pretty much there's two options for this. Uh, heat shock, which is where you put uh, the bacteria and the plasmid um, into ice and then hot water and then back into the ice. And throughout that process, it will be integrated into the bacteria or electroporation, which does the same thing but using electricity. And that was really quick and easy. The genetic modification process. So one of the first steps we had to do was just growing our plants. So the seeds of our plant are very small. So we had to use micro pipettes to plant the seeds. And we planted a new tray of seeds about every one to two weeks. So we would have plants that are a variety of growth stages for our project. We had to do a little experimenting of what the best growth plan is since we were growing them out of a classroom. And we had to plan around how to get them to stay alive during breaks and weekends. 
So in order to uh, obtain our final plasmid that we put in our plants, we had to order something called a gateway vector, which is essentially just a special type of plasmid. We ordered our gene in this gateway vector, and then we performed a reaction on it called an LR reaction. In this reaction, we took this vector with our gene in it and also a plasmid with the antibiotic resistance and herbicide resistance. And essentially, this reaction takes our gene and uh, basically a dummy gene and switches them. So in the end, we have a product which has our gene, the antibiotic resistance, and the herbicide resistance. We later sequenced this plasmid and we found that there was nothing out of the ordinary. So we can say that we had the correct product from this and there was likely little error in this part of the process. Okay, so after actually uh, integrating the plasmid into E. coli, the reason we use E. coli before putting into agrobacterium is because uh, synthetic genes and plasmids are very expensive and E. coli, uh, when reproducing, will also reproduce the plasmid. Um, so that's why we did this whole section. Pretty much we plated it to grow out the E. coli, inoculated it, which is pretty much uh, selecting specific colonies to grow even further, and then we mini-prepped it. Uh, pretty much mini-prepping is where you uh, lysis uh, the E. coli. Um, pretty much this breaks down the entire bacteria except the plasmid slash DNA inside it, and then from there you purify it through uh, several washes. And then from there we use electroporation to integrate the said plasmid um, into our agrobacterium. So in order to get our agrobacterium into our plants, we performed two procedures as previously mentioned, one of them being floral dip. In floral dip, we had to gently dip the buds of the flowers inside of media, which was a liquid that had our agrobacterium and other nutrients. When we dipped the bud inside this media, the agrobacterium from the media enter the seeds inside the buds. The agrobacterium will cut through the plant cell and put a part of their DNA into the plant's nucleus. This part that they place would have our gene in it. The, and we did not get to the next step due to the shortened timeline, but theoretically, if we harvested these infected seeds, planted them, and allowed them to grow, they would be transgenic, meaning they would have blue petals. The second procedure was vacuum infiltration. We placed a couple leaves inside petri dishes along with infiltration media that had our agrobacterium in it. When we put this in a vacuum chamber and lower the pressure, the plant cells open. And as we bring it back up to normal pressure, the plant cells close, allowing the media to enter the plant. From then, the agrobacterium infect the plant cells the same way as they did in floral. So after our floral dip procedure, we covered the plants with a sort of miniature greenhouse to maintain humidity. After vacuum infiltration, we took the infiltrated leaves and placed them on wet filter paper and petri dishes to keep them hydrated and healthy while we waited for results. We also kept control groups to compare our results to. Uh, we are happy to report that we did have some results from our project. So the important thing to note is each of our plasmids had something in them that are protein tags called GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein. And essentially this protein under light will glow under a special sort of light. And so um, in these pictures, in the image in the bottom left hand corner, you can see a discoloration on the leaf and there's a slight discoloration on the other leaf here, which is possible signs of our GFP being expressed. This means that in both our control plasmid and the plasmid with our gene for the blue coloration, um, it's being expressed in the gene, so it's present. Yep. So for a budget, uh, we are actually well under budget, uh, mainly because we thought that our synthetic gene and our control plasmids um, would be more expensive. But uh, because of several discounts from the companies we bought them from, that being Twist for the synthetic gene and then Add Gene for our control uh, plasmid, uh, we are well under budget. Um, and then we also got an Autobox grant, which made it so we didn't have to do any fundraising or anything of that sort. Uh, so we were around $450 under budget. So in terms of our group performance, we worked very well together as a group. We did a lot of communication, lots of problem solving. One thing that we could improve upon is making sure that everybody is updated on the various intricacies of every procedure. Since we did a lot of steps, sometimes someone wouldn't know what particular thing we were doing in a certain procedure. In terms of goal fulfillment, we most certainly learned a lot during this process. And so we have, can fully say that we definitely learned. And also our gene was inserted into our plants via the vacuum infiltration results we presented. Um, 
For future projects, we would like to say that time management is very important in terms of reaching your deadline because we did very slow research and so that led to us being very rushed with our procedures at the end. And we definitely also learned that um, that the genetics is very complicated. Um, I'd like to thank all our mentors and sponsors, our two mentors from Cargill, Mr. Covey and Ms. Cleland. They were very helpful throughout this entire process. We got to go into their lab several times and they gave us quite a few materials. We'd like to thank Dr. Pierce and despite him being in Europe, he still provided us with lots of great advice and procedures on this project. We'd also like to thank our two mentors from CSU, Dr. Nishimura and Mr. Wold McGimsey. We made use of facilities at CSU and they also donated us several materials, especially our plasmid, which was very important and crucial to this project. We'd also like to thank Mr. Dan Hauer for putting up with us all semester. He's been very helpful in this class and just a brilliant teacher. We'd also like to thank Twist, Otterbox, and AdGene for giving us the funds and materials for our project to become a reality. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Do you have any questions? There's a question Vicki wants to know if you intend to plant your transgenic seeds. We do intend to plant our transgenic seeds. Um, they're almost ready for harvesting as a matter of fact, and we're very excited to see if we have any results from that process as well. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Uh, just say hi to everybody out there. Everybody wave. Hi. Isn't this a spectacular looking group of young people? Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. All right. Sorry. I just had to... And these, these guys who are present in this. I just had to take a second to do that. All right. And we are uh, have our video game developers up next here. Hello. I'm Alan McFarland. And I'm Sawyer Pena. We did the fast video game to spur the adoption of Rust. Uh, we got the cool project. Uh. <laughs> So uh, please start downloading our game. If you're at home, please go to this tiny URL, tinyurl.com slash rust-game. And if you are in this classroom and on a school laptop, please open this tiny URL. That's tinyurl.com slash rust-game-web. Uh, yes, you will be playing it, uh, those of you who want to be doing it. Uh, the controls are also listed on the website. Uh, while you are doing that, uh, I would like you to still be quiet so we can continue. Uh. <laughs> so, there are some problems in computer science. Here are some of them. We don't have time to explain all of these, but if you work with computers a lot, you may know that you might spend your life trying to deal with some of these problems. Rust solves all of these. You don't need to know how these are solved by Rust, but just know that they are solved. So, if Rust is so great, then what's the problem that we are trying to solve? Well, this is a pie chart of adoption of programming languages, and as you can see, Rust is down here and very small. That means developing with Rust can be very difficult because there's a vicious cycle of people not using Rust, which means no libraries and tools are created for Rust, which means no one chooses to use Rust, and so on and so forth. So we want to fix this by making a video game that might convince people that they should start using Rust. We use the plan as you go method of planning, which was very effective for us because it didn't require us to have a specified deadline or a specified end goal, which meant we were able to be perfectly efficient. Our criteria for it was that it had to be in multiple files, it had to be in clean code functions, it had to be licensed under an open source license, it had to be cross platform, written in Rust, of course, and running the Vulkan GPU renderer. This was the first working build of our game. It was a big milestone for us because it was the first time we were able to successfully render a window and get some cubes running. Uh, this may not seem very difficult, but trust me, it's a lot more challenging than you think. Then we were able to add some features from Blender. Both of these models were designed in Blender, uh, which can be is very challenging to import into a game because you have to read the files. Unfortunately, they were also ghosts at this time. So the next phase of the game, I import the world from Minecraft to do a proof of concept to test for things like memory leaks, other performance issues, and also make sure that they are no longer ghosts, because as you can see, this bridge is not a ghost. Uh, we encountered some issues with when we were getting towards the final build of our game when we decided to do our scene at night. So these are all sort of lighting issues. Here, the shadows are all wiggly. Here, the light is going through the tree. 
here, I don't even know what's going on here or here, but they're kind of funny, yeah? and they were results of poor lighting algorithms that we were able to fix. Huh? Uh, we tried to fix some of these using ray tracing. Uh, many of you gamers have heard of ray tracing. It's all the rage nowadays. Uh, and we had some issues with it. This is our worst case, and this is our best case for ray tracing, and also kind of cut performance in half. Um, so we eventually decided to not use ray tracing, even though it does have scenarios where it can look very, very good. Huh? Um, so at the beginning of this project, I was going to be not just a graphic designer, but also part of the programming team. So I took all these notes on how to code in Rust, and um, I. This is an example of one of the practice games like that I made. It was like a guessing game. The computer would, you would have to like guess a number just over and over again until you got it right. Um, and this was this is just two screenshots of a very large Google Docs just filled with definitions of like Rust like knowledge in general, um, and. <laughs> Um, it didn't work. I didn't, learn it. I didn't learn it in time. Um, we had a lot to go through, and learning Rust, since it is such like a small program, like it's just a little bit hard to find resources to learn it. So I moved to Blender. Um, these are some of the big, very beginning things I created specifically in Blender. Um, but then I moved on to voxel art. Alan. <laughs> and um, I was able to create designs and patterns and assets within um, voxel art, which is like Minecraft, kind of, um, but it's like a web program. And I was able to import these uh, designs into Blender and put them all together. So this is like kind of like a glacier ice setting, forest and mountainous setting. And um, yeah. So one of the cool features of Rust is that it can compile to WebAssembly, which means it runs in your browser, as many of you students are seeing on your laptops. It runs the browser, which is very cool. Very few programming languages are able to do this. Um, but when we compiled to WebAssembly, there were a couple of issues. So this is an example of an effect called Bloom. So I'm going to turn off the light. Uh, you can see that uh, this is a lot of Bloom, and this is not no Bloom. And this is what we have in our final game. And Bloom is a very useful effect because it can make things feel a lot more realistic and look better. But for, with the WebAssembly version, for whatever reason, Bloom just didn't work, so we had to turn it off for that version. Another issue we faced with it is that in WebAssembly, uh, file sizes matter a lot because, as you may have noticed, there's a time when you have to download the game. And minimizing download timing, times can be very important because uh, users can click off after like 30 seconds of just running their game. So. These files all contain the exact same data, just represented in a different way. Huh? And as you can see, it could, can go from 120 megabytes down to low, less than one megabyte. Huh? And that could significantly improve our loading time performance. But unfortunately, the Rust tooling ecosystem is not quite mature enough where it could support these. Huh? So we had a bunch of issues. We were trying to render these in the browser, but it just didn't work out. Huh? Another issue we faced along the project was convex decomposition. Huh? This is an example of a convex decomposition. Huh? We went for this idea, not, not that one or that one. Um, and it's important because in order to do physics, you need convex objects. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of effort to calculate a convex decomposition from a shape. So what we were having to deal with is that every time we ran the game, we would have to do these convex decomposition calculations, which meant we had to deal with a one minute loading screen. And that was not acceptable for us. So we used the classic computer science technique of adding a cache. So in, we took all of the Blender files, did the calculations, and put them in a cache, which means now all users have to do is load it from the cache to their actual game. We also learned that uh, mature game engines have a significant amount of real-world value. This is Unreal Engine 5, and this is Unity. Uh, and many of the issues that we were faced have already been solved by numerous other game developers. So we were kind of reinventing the wheel, and that was very inefficient. One of the things I had to specifically learn throughout this process was figuring out a balance between a lot of detail or having a lot of time to create more assets. An example of a lot of detail would be this um, like fallen log and um, this tree. I put a lot of like detail and like small things into it. And in the end, I wasn't able to import this log into the game. I didn't have time. And I had to remove some of the details on this tree in order to make it fit within the game. And then on the other aspect end of that is no detail, but a lot of time. So I one of these 
is like some garden bed that I just created in Blender and used, put it into um, the setting. And there's no detail. It's boring. It's bland. Go back. And, <laughs> um, and um, but I had a lot of time after that to create more things, which is fun. Things are nice. So the like balance I found was creating like one, like for example, one block. This is just one single block that I painted details onto. Instead of having actual like physical details, it's all painted. It's all like different colors to mimic shading and mimic like it's actually dug out. It's not. It's fake. Yeah. Okay. So our cost for this project was zero dollars and zero cents. <laughs> our community members bothered for this project was zero and our unsafe shop incidents was zero. Therefore, <laughs> great success. Thank you. <laughs> Hey guys, we're gonna do, go ahead and run a demo um, up here on the screen so we can see how the game works. And I'll put that URL back up later too. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be playing it with uh, a controller because one of the things you were able to do is make controllers work. I can't really see it because of the angle, but you are <laughs> able to move around and explore the world. This uh, this computer is now also a 4K capable gaming machine, so the performance is not the greatest. Um, but you can see you can move the cube around, you can go turn it, make it bounce off a wall, see how much rotation you can get on it. Uh, very fun. Uh, you can go over to this mountain. Um, there's a little cave here you can explore. Uh, all of these were things that uh, Sawyer built in Blender and then I imported into Rust. Uh, I believe there's a city in here, uh, over here. Uh, you can see I added a whole bunch of cool lighting to represent aliens, and we also got all the cool shadow effects, which I enjoy a lot. <laughs> right now, huh? uh, you guys have the game on your machine, so you can you can play this if you'd like. Uh, thank you. Huh? <laughs> all right. Uh, did the medication distribution machine project. Uh, let me click on it once. It might be in the wrong spot. Let's try that. All right. Uh, I'm Bradley. I'm the project manager. Um, I'm Audrey, and I'm the primary designer. And my name is Leah, and I do a lot of the coding and circuitry. First off, I'd like to thank our mentors. Our main mentor was Cindy Lazinski. She is the founder and director of the Dementia Together program in Northern Colorado. She is also the first accredited speckle practitioner in Northern America, which, by the way, is a great method of learning what dementia is all about. Our second mentor is Lawrence Malk. Uh, he is the R&D director of HP Software and the PSD Computer Science Advisor and Chair. His role was to help us get out of loopholes from coding and actually help us find out um, ways to open that box in front of us. Uh, our mission was to help people living with early stages of dementia who uh, might not live with a caregiver, and this box is to help them remind to take their medication um, by day. So uh, this helps uh, those who live with dementia might be able to live at home a little bit longer without having uh, an assistant caregiver uh, by them 24-7. All right, so our, big, our main goals of the project, what our actual output, what we want it to be, is a mechanized pillbox that opens 24 hours um, to remind people living with memory loss diseases to take medication. Um, and as a broader goal, kind of extending on the mission, we want to promote self-autonomy and quality of life for people with dementia. Um, something our mentor said that really stuck with me is that we don't need to fix dementia, uh, we just need to fix our mindset around it. All right, so our timeline of the project is in three separate stages. Our first stage was research. So we had to research our mentors, we had to research our stakeholders, target groups, uh, and then we had to find a possible design for our pillbox in front of us. We researched many designs. And then finally, the Arduino components that actually go into the design. Uh, then our middle stage was when we began to initiate a lot of uh, building. So that's when we started buying stuff, 
uh, for this project, we started to make our designs through Tinkercad and Onshape. Uh, we began to use Arduino coding. Uh, we also uh, began to have meetings with our mentors. Uh, finally, in our last stage, we printed many, many, many drafts of our pillbox. Uh, we made different components, took stuff together, put them back, reassessed, and ultimately we came with this here pillbox in front of us. And finally, we were able to talk to our mentor to come to a design that um, kind of fits our main group. So initially, we, we researched um, a lot of how to use to get an on chip because that is what we did the whole design on. Um, we also had to learn how to use the 3D printers, which would be setting them up and um, so problem solving with them. And then we used a traditional pillbox. We bought one and kind of had that as the main idea for our typical or um, traditional design. All right, some code research that we needed to do was I was, I was a little bit unfamiliar with how to code with Arduino, which is basically like a C, it's similar to C and C++ language, um, but I'm more familiar with Java, so that was a little challenging, but um, I was able to uh, research. YouTube was really my friend there, and in terms of logic and theory, I consulted with our mentor, Lawrence Mao, who gave me some really good ideas on how we were going to loop through the uh, servos opening and basically what we used was if I take off the lid right here we have an Arduino board um, with seven servo motors attached and a piezo buzzer that plays sound. All right so in order to use our or to make the um, design like I mentioned earlier we used um, Tinkat and Onshape we um, used the traditional um, pillbox as our template and so like our, the picture on the top left and was our very first design and then on the top right was our very first print. We knew that that needed to have um, capsules or compartments where the pill would be held, um, lids that would like cover each of the um, compartments and then we knew that we need something to be able to open up the lids and by that we knew we, knew we were going to use um, servo, motor, ser servo motors um, throughout the project as I'm designed and arms to attach the servo motors, and then um, a, a lid for the whole box as a whole, and then as well as the little compartments where uh, the servos would be held. Um, so in creating the design, we met with our um, mentor, Cindy Lisinski, and she helped us a lot with um, how to make this design um, best optimal for people who are living with dementia and how they can use our um, pillbox, a part of that was we made the compartments both longer and wider in order for people with the possible dexterity issues to be able to grab the pill easier. We also added color variation. Um, you may have noticed on the last slide the picture, um, um, yep, it's all blue and, and now we made different colors for um, just adding color variation with it. And then, can you go back? Of course. Thank you. Um, we also made the whole lid detachable. We had a few um, field prints and a, a few designs that didn't end up working out, but we were able to learn, take the best from all of our designs. Um, the lid originally was supposed to um, not be detachable, but after a field print gave us the idea to make it detachable, it ended up, ended up being a lot easier to be able to see the code and the circuitry like easier. Okay, so um, like I said, I had to learn a little bit about, more about how the coding would work with um, the new language and what we wanted to do is ha um, have input for the current time and what time we wanted somebody wanted the medication to be taken so then it would program a delay and then after that delay the first lid would open so that you could um, put in those times and it would open every 24 hours after that consistently. Um, we also incorporated the piezo buzzer um, that is synchronized with the lids opening so that um, people would be alerted. Uh, something nice about our project was that the total cost was $19.99 for a 10-pack of servo motors, and the rest um, of the materials we had uh, were already on hand at the school. So that's nice. Um, so creating the code and circuitry, some struggles I had was uh, developing the actual pillbox. We went through a lot of variations and incorporating servo, the, incorporating the servo motors and the piezo buzzer together was a challenge because. Um, of the way we wanted the circuit. One thing you change would change everything else and deciding if errors were because of code or circuitry is another problem like the box wasn't running, you have to decide which, what the problem is. Successes, um, getting the servos open, 
creating a first delay and figuring out how to loop and uh, eventually learning all about how um, this would run. And given more time, it would be fun to incorporate an app that um, allow, could allow caregivers or family members to see if medication had been taken, um, possibly add a screen and more complex notifications with uh, like voice, uh, like audio files um, or like voices, if that makes sense. Uh, so the final result, um, I'll plug it in. So, so what you're going to see is that um, right now it's on a 30 second delay just off, based off of how I've programmed it so far. Um, you can make this five hours, 12 hours, whatever time you're putting in, whatever time you want it to take. Right now I just have it for 30 seconds. After that, you're going to see a door open every three seconds. Um, in an actual application, that would be 24 hours. Just it's obviously not realistic for um, presenting it right now. So this delay will be three seconds, but it would usually be every 24 hours. And it's going to go off with a notification. And yeah, <laughs> just have to wait. Sorry. <laughs> So right now it'd be open for 24 hours, they all close. And then while it's open for that 24 hours, um, a caregiver would need to come um, or somebody with er enough uh, early enough stage could refill all their, medi their medications um, by the time they close, which would be 24 hours. So um, the next thing is that a caregiver would be not needed a lot, but um, there would be a very little need for one. Um, something else about the pill box as a whole is that um, each of the letters that I put on um, are for able to identify the um, days of the week. If um, they weren't able to see or hear or something, they can, um, or you know, I guess, would be able to feel it better. One more thing that I want to mention is the size of our first pill box compared to this one is dramatically increased because compared to this box, it is about that big from our first one. So just not even half of that. So we definitely had to experiment with size and get that to our liking. Uh, then we also have our successes and challenges as a whole. So uh, our major success was we managed to make a functioning pillbox. Uh, this uh, was our primary goal and it was the goal that we set on. Uh, we also focused on our strengths and built off that. Uh, so Leah was uh, really good at coding. Audrey was good at the design need for research. Uh, then we also maintained our original goal throughout the project, like I mentioned earlier, and we were able to stay on a preferred timeline. Some challenges that we've had uh, was our the three printing itself. Sometimes it was a little bit of a struggle. There were a lot of failed prints um, because sometimes there's either malfunctioning or whatnot. Uh, there was also extracurricular, extracurricular activities among all of us, and it might have interfered with communication and scheduling. Uh, and then finally, one last challenge was uh, more so for the coding and design. Uh, what happened if there was a problem? Why did this not open? Why is it that this is stuck? Uh, was it a circuit problem? Was it a coding problem? So it was finding out what that was. And um, that's about it. OK, so um, some areas of growth that we saw was technically like skills. We improved on 3D printing, uh, coding with Arduino and C and C++. Uh, CAD programs, uh, designing circuits, and outreach to community members was a big one. And growth in more of the STEM skills where we improved on time management, understanding of engineering principles, um, effective communication skills, and creative problem solving. All of the STEM skills that Leah just mentioned can be gained and um, can apply in future careers in STEM or not, but um, we can also use these as technical growth and these can be used in future prog projects. And then technical skills can um, spark new interests in uh, new subjects. For an extension, if we had more time on this project, we would like to add um, compartments for both AM and PM medication. Um, sometimes we'll need to take them in the day and night, so we add more compartments for that. And that actually wouldn't affect our code too much, but add a little bit more complexity. Um, we'd want to incorporate an app for caregivers. This would look like um, updating them when um, the person um, had taken their pills and whenever they needed to refill all of the pills. Um, and then we want to add a screen. We want to add a screen um, to, to display instructions to the person using our uh, medication distribution.
Uh, here is the sources that we used throughout our project. And finally, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Rocket Man. Here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, and for the past semester, as you all have known, um, we've been working on developing a model rocket thrust vector control, or a model rocket that utilizes thrust vector control. Uh, my name is Quentin. Uh, I'm Jackson. I'm Jack. And I'm Dimitri. Let's get into it. So our project's goals were to develop a model rocket that utilizes thrust vector control. Um, we also wanted to make sure, and we'll get into this later, that our rocket would be open source and available for anybody um, who actually wanted to look at it online. Big thank you first to Charlie Garcia and the Colorado Space Business Roundtable. Um, these guys have been instrumental in helping us out um, and making sure that our rocket works successfully. So some things about um, our inspiration that we ended up going with. Um, we looked online at a lot of successful gimbals on YouTube. Um, this is uh, something that a lot of other people had done, except for um, the fact that this, even though it had been done before um, by a lot of others, um, it is not shared publicly or free. Um, and as you can see here, uh, this is $35 for a CAD file. It's very high quality, but we believe that we could do basically the same thing without having to pay for that and make it available for anybody else. Um, our initial timeline, we used Team Gantt as the other teams did as well. Um, and more or less, um, our actual project tracked along almost completely with what we had on our Team Gantt, other than actually launching the rocket um, and yeah, we worked pretty well on that. Um, so basically, um, we all had our different roles. This is actually a pretty compartmentalized um, group. So I guess if you guys want to start introducing yourselves on what you did. All right, I'm Jack. I was in charge of 3D modeling the rocket gimbal, the rocket nose cone, and assembling the rocket and creating the parachute. Uh, I'm Dimitri. I was also working on the CAD and designing the rocket. Uh, I'm Jackson. I helped with code, soldering the flight computer, and mathematical modeling. And I'm Quentin, obviously, um, and I worked as the project manager to work on the CAD code, building the rocket, and doing basically all the other project managers management stuff as well. Um, so more or less, um, our initial research, um, we made a 20 page, I think it's actually closer to 25 pages of research document going over um, how gimbals work, um, Arduino coding, um, partial integral derivative control, we'll also go over that, um, and rocket mechanics as a whole. So what is really instrumental to thrust vector controlled model rocketry is that you have a thrust coming out of your rocket that then provides, when you turn it by some angle, a thrust uh, torque that will then rotate your rocket around its center of gravity to keep it stable. Um, so uh, we researched PID control, which is a method of control used in applications like self-driving cars. And in this case, it makes a rocket stay as straight as possible as long as possible. All right, initial design criteria for our gimbal. Uh, we wanted it to be 3D printed, and we did not really take into consideration weight and size. And here are the components we decided on. For our engine, we used an F-15 because of our rocket size and the motor's long burn time. Our flight computer was a Teensy 4.1, which is similar to an Arduino, but has much faster processor speed. Uh, our MPU 6050 was an altimeter and gyroscope, and our BMP was our altimeter. The first rocket, this is our initial gimbal design. It was about five inches in diameter, uh, pretty big. Um, this is the full model of the rocket. Um, this is two parts, the main body tube and the main rocket. We made it short, shorter so we could fit it on school 3D printers. Um, and we built the gimbal first and built the rocket around it. And here I've, I'll try to show it to everybody, including the camera. Um, this was kind of a prototype for this part of the rocket that you see right here, um, more or less. Uh, it, we had a lot of layer shifts um, during our process. Uh, I guess I can kind of bring this up. This is about is the size of my face. I mean, it's huge. Um, it was not a very great design, as we will find out later. All right, and these are some of the first gimbal designs that we had. Um, and if you want to talk about some of the issues they had. Yeah, we had six of them initially. Um, this one over here had poor tolerance, so it would wiggle. Um, 
side to side, it would rotate. This one has a rod going right through the middle. That's where our engine should be. Don't know how that <laughs> happened. Um, this one was actually our closest to our final one, um, but the plastic pieces were rough and the action was not as smooth. Um, so one unexpected challenge we came was modeling the relationship between gimbal angle and servo motor angle, uh, which is nonlinear gimbal angle on the x-axis, uh, servo angle on the y-axis. And since equations like that are at least relatively hard for people like me, who is, I'm in college algebra, um, to kind of understand, um, we took that down to a more simpler level and we input it into GitHub. Um, GitHub has a Wikipedia basically feature um, which allows you to um, basically explain stuff like that on a basic level um, for everybody. Um, and GitHub also allows us to make uh, our project open source so others can download our stuff uh, rep very easily. Uh, here's the first draft of our code. Uh, we did put in basic PID, our accelerometer, and some equations. However, it was unstable because most of it was reused from an online tutorial. And right here, I guess, is our flight computer, our first one. We use the Arduino Nano since we didn't actually have the TNC 4.1 with us yet. Um, and here's a video of Jackson um, with the servo. If you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, so this is just a test to show the gimbal's frames of motion. Uh, it's not taking data from the accelerometer like it would in a real flight. Like in a real flight, the gimbal would move based on which direction the rocket is pointing. So in our second rocket, um, this is around the time that we got our mentor, Charlie Garcia, um, from Agile Space. Um, we, he took a look at our rocket, our initial rocket. Um, he realized that it was going to be very unaerodynamically stable and that it was going to be very easy to flip out of control and crash into our school. Um, and so as a result, um, yes, we uh, let these guys talk about how they changed it. Yeah, because of that, we had to uh, make the rocket way skinnier. So we turned it from about five inches wide to about three. And that took many hours of work, and we had to basically redesign the whole gimbal. Um, we shot for plus or minus five degrees in the gimbal, which we ended up getting in the CAD. And this is our parachute deployment system. As you can see, we have a servo at the end of the nose cone. And the nose cone is actually in two pieces that come apart. And the parachute would go in there. Um, we don't have it in there right now. But yeah, the servo would just rotate to uh, open that thing. Uh, Let me try to fix you here. Are you there? Yep. Okay. Cool. All right, so this is an interior view of our rocket. Um, the gimbal is down here in the lower section. The flight computer would sit in here. Um, the parachute goes up here in the nose cone, and this is the parachute re uh, release mechanism. Um, can you go back? Yeah. yeah. Um, we used solid work, SOLIDWORKS to calculate mass properties that we needed, such as center of mass and center of gravity. Uh, and then our code's second draft uh, had better PID and we added the altimeter. The biggest change was suggested by our mentor, which was uh, organization. We split our code into sections based on the state the rocket was in, like preparing for launch, launch and parachute deployment, which made it much more efficient for the computer to run. And here is a video that we caught um, of our gimbal. I'll try to actually show this um, just first before I play the video. Um, hopefully everybody can see it. You basically have the gimbal right here. Um, it is printed in carbon fiber now, um, and it has about uh, plus or minus, I think, four degrees compared to the uh, plus or minus 20 on this thing right here. Um, let's try to play that. So as you can see, uh, you tilt the, the gimbal um, by some amount, or rather the rocket, I should say, and in response, the servo will change um, to counter that uh, rotation. <coughs> Working. There we go. Okay. Um, and right there on that uh, left side of the screen right there um, is our finished flight computer. Um, it utilizes the TNC 4.1, the BMP 280, and the MPU 6050, as we previously mentioned. Um, although on Friday, December 2nd, our, our, uh, the core clock on the inside of this thing um, decided to head out. Um, we don't know why. Um, and as a result, we had to switch to the uh, Arduino Uno, basically. Um, and that meant that we had to get rid of our BMP 280 or our 
altimeter. I can't really speak too well. Um, just due to uh, memory loss issues. Um, and right there, that's our assembled uh, rocket. And we don't actually have it assembled right now just because we wanted to show it compartmentalized. Um, so yeah, we've, we've built the rocket. Um, we have working code. And uh, we also have a good GitHub page documentation so that others can actually build this rocket on their own if they so choose to. Um, some of the problems that we encountered, we weren't able to fly. We just didn't feel, feel too safe, um, basically launching what is the equivalent of a guided missile. Um, we also did, uh, had to switch our flight computer, and now as a result, we don't have an altimeter on it, um, and we weren't able to implement some of our code in there, um, even though we know that it does work. Uh, we also had less gimbal authority than we expected, just due to general uh, servo quality. It might have not been the best, but yeah. Um, if we had more time, we would have bought another TNC 4.1. Um, we probably would have tested our state detection after we implemented our altimeter after that. And then we would have obviously launched it whenever we felt like uh, we were not going to endanger anybody. So our ultimate cost ended up being $216. Um, a decent portion of that was actually the flight motors, which we have not used yet. Um, and another decent amount was just, you know, the overall cost of everything that had come through. Um, so our group performance, these guys worked really well. They worked really hard and they worked really fast. Um, the changes that we made, um, I really find incredible. Um, and, you know, these guys really worked really well on that. So like I said, um, some other stuff that we ended up realizing during the project. Um, largest thing we kind of realized is that even though you can research a lot um, as much as we did, um, there are going to be a lot of things that you still won't uh, realize um, while you're actually going through it. Um, and technology, um, like our computer designed to fry itself, um, that is obviously very annoying. Um, but yeah, thanks again to Charlie Garcia and the STEM program and CSBR. Um, yeah, that's that. Here are our sources um, and then questions, I guess. Uh, one question is real fast. How did you guys get interested in rocket science? It has to be like one sentence. Real quick. Oh, goodness, one <laughs> sentence. OK, that's a little bit hard. Um, I've just been interested in rockets, yeah, since that, since I was little. That, yeah, it's just been like, All right, yeah, we need to keep going anyway. Bill's about to read.